So we are ready to start. Thank you so much to everybody who has joined us today. Um, we are really looking forward to this presentation with you about North Central Florida's railroad history. Um, Jonathan Nelson came in to do some research at the museum a couple of months ago, and I kind of uh, coerced him into doing this presentation for us. So I'm really excited um, for him to be able to share what he knows about the railroads with all of you. Um, so just getting some of the housekeeping out of the way. Um, if you have questions throughout the presentation, uh, please do put them into the Q&A box in, through Zoom, or if you're watching on our Facebook live stream, you can put them in the uh, comment section. And at the end of the presentation, we will do a question and answer session using those questions. Um, for those of you who registered via Zoom, there will be a brief survey coming out for your email tomorrow. Um, where you can give us feedback about this program and let us know what you would like to see from us in the future. Um, so please do uh, take the time to answer that for us. It would be very helpful. Um, and then I would also encourage you, uh, if you are not already a member of the Matheson, to please consider joining us. We rely on our members and donors to continue carrying out our mission. Um, and we have a variety of levels of membership. Um, so there is something that should be comfortable for everybody. And we would encourage you to consider joining through our website and that would uh, help us to continue putting on programs uh, like this one. Um, so Jonathan Nelson is now a full-time resident of Alachua County again. He graduated from the University of Florida with an MAT or Master of Arts in Teaching in History in 1977. He is a native Floridian whose first memory in life was a speeding train scaring the daylights out of him. Ever since then, he has had a love affair with the railroads Today, we will talk about a few of Alachua County's early railroads and their contribution to the development of the county and North Florida. Sit back, relax, and please ask some questions. So now I will go ahead and get the presentation pulled up and turn it over to Jonathan. Caitlin, thank you very much for that nice introduction. I appreciate it. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here today to talk about railroads. It's one of my favorite subjects. And like you said, it was my first memory in life. In Florida, trains came later than to the rest of the country. One, we didn't become a state right away. We weren't a state until 1844, although there was territorial railroads. Uh, the railroads that came to Alachua County uh, came a little later. And uh, our early railroads were the Tallahassee Railroad, the Iola and St. Joseph's Canal Company Railroad, the St. John's, they had something in common. They didn't have rails made out of iron. They had wooden rails and they had strap iron on top. And they were all these the little trains were pulled by mules. Uh, and of course, if there was a rattlesnake in the track, which happened sometimes, the mule would bolt. They'd have to go get them. So there was all these kinds of anecdotal funny stories about these little railroads. But eventually they were able to get steam engines. They could afford steam engines. And almost all of the railroads originally in Florida were wood burning steam engines, which was different than the rest of the United States because mainly they were burning coal. But here in the beginning, almost all burned wood. Uh, the uh, first major rail system to come to central Florida and to go through Gainesville was if you look at the top of the slide that Caitlin put on there, the Florida Railroad. This was David Levy Uly's railroad. David Levy Uly was our first Senator. Uh, he was our first state Senator. And he did command a lot of power. He was a, a major slaveholder with over 300 slaves. He had a large plantation. And he dreamed of running a railroad to link the two coasts. Because at that time, there was a port at Cedar Key. It was considered a deep water port, 20 feet. That was deep water back then. There was one in Fernandita, about 25 feet. That was considered a deep water port. Uh, Jacksonville was difficult to get into and out, out of because you had to use the river, the St. John's. So he thought if he could link these two, he could shorten the time of many ships by transferring the goods to Cedar Key, sending them over to Fernandina or bringing them north to Jacksonville. And so he got this idea to build the Florida Railroad. Uh, he hired almost exclusively, uh, this, remember, this is the 1850s, and, and he hired almost exclusively slave labor. Uh, it was a different arrangement with his, with his slaves that worked for this railroad. First, they had to volunteer for it. You know, they, they, they weren't just assigned, you're gonna work on the railroad all day. It was hard work, it was long work. It was 10 hours a day, six days a week, one day for the Sabbath. And uh, he, pr he promised that the food would be good. Uh, it would be decent, all you could eat. And he, he paid them. And so, you know, it was rare that a slave got wages, 
But depending on what their job was and how good they were at performing it, they got between 50 cents and $1 a day, which was more than any other slaves were making in the South. Uh, it was still a brutal system slavery, but they were getting some wages for what they did. And he had a company store along the track as they developed uh, west towards Cedar Key. The company store would move and you could use the money in the company store. Uh, very rarely would a slave be allowed into the town like Gainesville or something like that, uh, only, only to see a doctor or something like that. Now, of course, and with this, he provided complete medical benefits. Uh, I don't want anybody running down to sign up for this. No, it wasn't like that. But, but it was better than sticking all day on the plantation and not having anything to show for it. Uh, there were some cases where if a man worked very hard and long hours and maybe he was disabled from doing work that he would get his freedom. That happened a few times too. So labor wasn't a problem at all. Labor was plentiful and cheap. Uh, these were real rails. Levy decided to use broad gauge, five feet, instead of four feet, eight and a half. Uh, he decided that he could run heavier trains like that. And a lot of the U.S. railroads were at that time five feet. Now, standard gauge, a lot of you say, where did they come up with four, four feet and eight? Well, Amtrak today uses standard gauge. A tri-rail in Miami, Brightline, uh, all of them, a CSX railroad, they all use standard gauge, four feet, eight and a half. Where would you come up with a crazy number like that? Very simple. The Romans, what do you mean the Romans? Well, when the Romans, Roman Empire conquered the British, right? Uh, and they conquered the Celts and they occupied the mainland of Britain. They brought their war chariots and they brought their supply chariots. And uh, she, I'll be comment on the slide in a minute. And the, the, the distance between the, uh, Caitlin, can you leave that one on for just a second? Thank you. The distance between the, the wheels of a steam locomotive in Britain, they manufactured the very first steam locomotives in the early 1800s, late uh, 19th century, they were four feet, eight and a half inches. Why? Because Roman chariot wheels width were four feet, eight and a half inches. And there were ruts in the British roads from the time of the Roman occupation. And they dropped the rails into the ruts. This is the story. I can't say that it's 100% true, but everybody tells that same story of where they got four feet, eight and a half. They sold us our first steam engines. They were four feet, eight and a half in width. So we got them and we continued to make them. But uh, Levy decided, well, he was a big shot. He had a lot of money. He got a land grant and therefore he was going to use five foot so his trains could carry more. Now I mentioned this land grant thing. So how did you build the railroad back then? Well, you could use some of your own money, but railroads were very, very expensive to build. Even back then, even with slave labor, the cost of the materials, shipping the materials, the cost of feeding and taking care of the men, they were very, very expensive. And so uh, as a result, uh, you, you know, you didn't want to waste your money on anything, anything frivolous. So the government, the federal government and the state government would give uh, land grants, large amounts of land. Levy got 880,000 acres and his railroad was allowed to sell that land. It was adjacent to the tracks and sometimes 150 miles from the tracks. Now, the prime land near the railroad, he could sell sometimes $50, $100 an acre. If it was 100 miles away from the railroad, he got one to $2 an acre, but it was all his land to sell for the benefit of the railroad, okay? You only had to give it back if you couldn't sell it and the railroad went broke. So as long as you kept the, the, it going. So it, it, this became a wonderful way to spread the wealth and to build your railroad without going personally bankrupt. Uh, many railroads got land grants. Some were successful, some weren't. Levy's railroad with his big land grant was successful in the beginning. Then comes the Civil War, okay? And with the Civil War, of course, for the first year and a half, it was, it, he loved this because he was moving Confederate troops from place A to place B. He was moving Confederate rations and, and, and stores. And he was moving the whole, everything for the state of Florida was running one way or the other on Levy's Railroad for the Confederate Army. Okay, plus of course, he's a Confederate Senator. Now a federal gunboat in, uh, I believe it was uh, 1862, a federal gunboat makes, gets into the harbor at Cedar Key, which wasn't protected and burns the entire town. They burned Cedar Key to the ground. The federal gunboat blew it up and burned it. A couple of months later, a couple of federal gunboats get into the harbor at Fernandina and do the same thing. Burn everything down. It's all gone. You can't go to Fernandina and Cedar Key and find an antebellum building that dates from the Civil War. They don't exist. They were burned, to my knowledge. Okay. So uh, the, the Union Army did that, the Union Navy. Well, 
what happens? Of course, the railroad's going to go broke. Oh, and the Confederates didn't help the matter either. They took up 20 miles of Levy's tracks, right? Their own, their own guy. Why? They needed the, they they needed the, that steel to melt down for uh, you know for for the war. They and, and they want to lay the rails elsewhere to move their goods. So his his own people went against them, and the railroad goes broke. And after the war, it's going to change its name to the. Can you change the slide, please? Uh, change it one, one, one more time. Yeah, it's going to change its name to the Florida Railroad and Navigation Company. It's the same railroad, but they're going to extend their lines. So they're going to go south. They're still going to Cedar Key. And uh, it changed the slide, please. All right, there they are. There's, there's a schedule there showing their, their line. Now, this, this was originally Levy's line. Change it again, please. Okay, good. And it's going to end up as the Florida Central and Peninsula. And eventually, don't change it yet, eventually this is going to get sold to the Seaboard Railroad. And the Seaboard Railroad in one form or another, like the Seaboard Coastline, will last servicing Gainesville until the 1970s. All right. Uh, the, the Levy's Railroad was one of the, the first railroad in Florida to move the mail. They had RPO cars, railway post office cars. Mm -hmm. So he would move the mail. Not only would he move the mail, but he would... Uh, 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 telegraph lines were set up along the line, and some of the goods that the railroad tra uh, the railroad tra transported were uh, not only people but cotton, lumber, tobacco, livestock, oranges, and phosphate. I mentioned that it was a broad gauge railroad. It was 156 miles in length, and uh, when eventually it ends up as the Florida Central and Peninsula uh, Railroad, the depot. You may be curious about that. Go to the next slide, please. It ends up as the seaboard, but the depot, will you have that depot down at Depot Avenue? I don't know, we don't have a picture of the depot at Depot Avenue, but you can go down there and see it. It's, it's now been restored. Uh, it's got shops in it. Um, we believe this building was built about 1902. Go back one, please. When the seaboard took over from the Florida Central and Peninsula. Uh, we don't know the original depot. It could have burned down. It, it, we don't know what happened to it. But that building dates from 1902. That is the location of where the first depot would have been. Okay, that was that was the location of Gain, Gainesville's oldest depot. So at least that's been preserved. And uh, right around there is where David Levy Uly's first Florida depot was. And it eventually ended up as the seaboard. Uh, next one, please. Next slide. It got reorganized as the Florida Transit, then became Florida Railway Navigation, bought, the, bought by the Florida Central and Peninsula in 1902, and then becomes a seaboard in late 1902. Uh, the stops, you want to go to the next one, please? Okay, uh, that's Archer. The stops included uh, Waldo, Fairbanks, Arundondo, Archer, Bronson, Rosewood, and Cedar Key. Uh, I'll mention something sad. We don't have a picture of the Rosewood Depot. Many of you know of the massacre that took place, unfortunately, at Rosewood where uh, many people were killed. Uh, the railroad played a part in this, I would say a positive role. Uh, the people started to run from Rosewood as it was burning during this massacre. And many of them made it to the Rosewood train station and some kept running until they got to the Archer train station. Now. This is the Archer train station they got to, the one showing you, and that track is, is the one going to Gainesville. Uh, the Seaboards had a local train on schedule, regular train leaving Cedar Key. Uh, they heard about this. They, they received a telegraph on, before they left Cedar Key. He stopped in Rosewood, and then when he saw, he, they, the few people got on at Rosewood, they said, go to Archer. He then proceeded to Archer, and he stopped at Archer. They, the estimate is they saved 75 African-American lives. The seaboard conductor, he packed the train. He only had a, a couple of coaches on there. They packed the train and they made it to Gainesville. Now, once they made it across the Alachua County line, there were deputies on each side of the tracks, Alachua County deputies. They were there to protect these African-Americans and to prevent the Klansmen and other people, other hooligans and murderers. They were, they were there to protect them from crossing the Alachua County line into Alachua County. The Levi County, Le Levy or Levy, Levy County Sheriff's Department uh, was small and, and the, the sheriff tried, but he, he couldn't do the job. He, did, he had a limited amount of deputies and he, it seems that he did little or nothing. He was relieved of his job, but it was after a lot of people were killed and terrorized. But Alachua County, at least once they made it across the Alachua County line on the train, they were safe. 
And I want to give the, I don't know who the conductor was and who the engineer, but you got to give them credit for that because they didn't have to stop and they did. And it was a wonderful thing that they saved those people. So I just thought I would mention that. Uh, the motto of, this, of the Florida Railroad was go south, young man, go to Florida. Free tickets and 40 acres for $50. That's not bad. Uh, and I, I mentioned northbound freight, southbound freight that the Florida handled were dry goods, livestock feed, finished lumber, paint, fertilizer, mail and express. Uh, and of course the Southern Express Company operated on the line. That would have been today's United Parcel. Later the Southern Express became American Railway Express, later Railway Express Agency. And today, like I said, that would have been United Parcel. So that operated over it too. Uh, what happened with Cedar Key is it didn't, it didn't get shallow, Tampa got deep. And they say that Tampa had a real deep water port. Well, almost all of the business that was the shipping business coming out of Cedar Key switched to Tampa at some point. And once that happened, Cedar Key just became a fishing village again. And 1932, Seaboard took up their tracks, knocked down their depot, and pulled out of Cedar Key. And they and they've been pulled back all the way to Archer. Okay. Uh, and so what's left today of the Florida Railroad? We have uh, uh, Waldo, uh, the, the train it, uh, goes from Waldo to uh, uh, Uly and then to Fernandina. It's only a few miles that are really left of the railroad. Uh, all passenger service ended on the uh, Florida Railroad in 1932. Uh, I mean, that was, of course, already the Seaboard Railroad by then. A freight did continue to operate until 1972. Uh, I mentioned here some special trains, uh, the University of Miami and Florida, that's the Gators, had a long-standing tradition, and trains would be rented to go to Miami from Gainesville for the hurricane games at the Orange Bowl. When the Hurricanes came to play the Gators in Tallahassee, of course, uh, they, uh, they would take the train to that. Um, next slide, please. All right, so this is the Gainesville Freight Station that was built in the 40s on the seaboard, uh, and these special trains that came from Miami or came from Tallahassee for the football games, the special trains would park here during the games. You see the two tracks. So they would use, they would go on both tracks. Uh, they would leave Miami from Carl Gable Station, uh, which was adjacent to the University of Miami, packed 20 cars each. They would get to Waldo and one at a time would take the Wyatt Waldo and back in the 14 miles to Gainesville. And then they would line up next to each other and everybody would be detraining. They'd get on buses, chartered buses, and would take them to old Florida Field. No, it wasn't called the Swamp Forever. It was just Florida Field. Kind of sentimental about that. And they would go to the game and have a good time and then they would uh, usually lose. But if they won, the Miami fans would be happy. They get on their 20 car trains and go back to Miami. Now, the stories, the antidotal stories I heard of people who were on the train as kids and remember is that the big thing on the train was there was a couple of bar lounge cars and they would get, people would just get totally loaded. I guess, you know, you're on a train, you don't have to worry about driving. And uh, so people would get pretty drunk and high and stuff like that, but people had a good time. And if you wanted to go to a Gainesville, if you wanted to go to a FSU game, they also chartered trains. And if you want to do it yourself, it wasn't too difficult back in the 50s and early 60s. You went to Waldo, you got on a regular seaboard passenger train. They were running six north and six south at that time. And you went to Baldwin. And at Baldwin, you caught the westbound New Orleans and Florida Limited, which was a slow train that took you to Tallahassee. And then you could watch the game and you'd come the same way on the way back. So that was all very doable. And, you know, kids could have a lot of fun doing that. Unfortunately, this seaboard freight station that we're looking at was torn down about 1982. And uh, it was a real shame because it was a restaurant for a while and something else. And unfortunately, uh, I'm glad they saved the old 1902 Florida Central and Peninsula Depot on Depot Avenue, but it would have been nice if they could have saved this one too. Uh, next, please. Uh, this is a brochure advertising Seaboard's Winter Resorts. Gainesville wasn't included because the passenger trains were gone by 1932. Go ahead. Uh, Florida Railway Navigation, one of their publicity brochures. This is the line that went through Gainesville. Next one, please. Ah, so let's go to railroad number two, the Florida Southern. So this is a railroad that's going to build from Palatka west to Gainesville. And then before it gets to Gainesville, it's going to go to Rochelle where there's a junction, that's the name of it, Rochelle. 
And to the right, it's going to go to Gainesville. And to the left, it's going to go down to McIntosh and uh, all, all the way to Leesburg. This is known as the Florida Southern. They didn't have a lot of money like David levy Uly did when he started. So they're, they're going to go with three-foot gauge. Three-foot is narrow gauge. And they figure, well, maybe one day we can replace it. That's what happened. So they're, they operate, they, uh, they, rec they build about three quarters of a mile a day uh, from Palatka. And they come into Gainesville uh, uh, about 1880, end of 1881, 82. They're our second railroad in Gainesville. Uh, they build a station, this is according to the Traveler's Official Guides of the time that I have, 75 yards away from the station over there on Depot Avenue, the Florida Central and Peninsula's Depot. So they're, they're 75 yards away from that one. And then they curve from that point, they curve north. Uh, they get an easement from the city of Gainesville to run down the middle of Main Street. They were out of money and they couldn't afford to purchase any more right away through Gainesville. That was expensive. So the city of Gainesville said, well, we want you to be alive and healthy. We'll give you some land. You run it down the middle of Main Street. Well, not everybody was overjoyed with that, but there weren't that many automobiles in uh, 1881 and two. In fact, I don't think there was any. So that, you know, the mules and the horses would have to wait. Now, you should know that they ran down Main Street all the way until 1947. And uh, th they ran it four miles an hour. Do you wanna to go to the next slide, please? They eventually became the Atlantic coastline. Keep going, please. The Atlantic coastline, go ahead. All right, so this is not the first depot they built. I mentioned they built a depot 75 yards away from the Florida Central and Peninsula Depot, the one that today is on Depot Avenue. And what happened is while they were uh, waiting, uh, when, the, the, when they came into town, they started building north and they, get, they got met right away by the uh, Savannah, Florida and Western, which was a plant system railroad. And they were racing both to get to Gainesville. So the Florida Southern makes it first. But within a couple of weeks, the Savannah, Florida and Western pulls into town coming from the north. They sent a branch from Live Oak. They were a big, powerful railroad that eventually is gonna become the majority of the Atlantic coastline owned by Henry B. Plant. Henry Plant and Flagler were the two railroad oil magnates of Florida. And so, we have this, we don't have a picture of the Florida Southern's depot that was 75 yards from the Florida Central and Peninsula Depot. We just hear stories about it. And here comes the Savannah, Florida and Western Depot. They're the competitor. They run right down to where those, where the seaboard station is, the one that's 75 yards away, the Florida Central and Peninsula. They run right down there. They order a, uh, a diamond that is to cross the seaboard tracks and to connect with the Florida Southern tracks. You can't stop them, they're big and powerful. And they said, we're not gonna use the little uh, Florida Southern Depot, we'll build our own. So literally adjacent, five, 10 feet away, they build their own big depot next to the Florida Southern. So that instead of using a union depot to save money on personnel, they have two separate depots and then 75 yards away, okay, is this uh, Florida Central and Peninsula Depot, the one that's on Depot Avenue now. And this Savannah, Florida and Western, okay, is only gonna be here for five years because they pull in in 1897, or, 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 excuse me, no, yeah, that's right. They pull in in 1897 and then the Savannah, Florida Western comes and takes over, okay? Uh, it, it's taken over by the plant system. And then the plant system is taken over by the, uh, by the Atlantic coastline. Now I got my dates a little confused there. Uh, I mentioned that the Florida Southern came in in approximately 1888, and it was only a couple weeks later, 1888, that the Savannah, Florida Western pulled in. They're purchased shortly thereafter, uh, not too many years after, by the plant system, which becomes the Atlantic coastline in 1902. So what are we looking at? We're looking at the Atlantic coastline ticket office in Gainesville on Main Street. Uh, and they, they, they closed their, the, when it became the plant system, the plant system built this building. Uh, and where was it, where would it be today? Well, it's off of Maine uh, and it's, it's on Northwest First Avenue and there is a big bank there. Now you can't see it in the pictures, but we're gonna show you the shops because the railroad had all of its shops and all of its uh, barns and for holding animals 
and uh, all of its uh, uh, balconies uh, for, for things that would be delivered. So if you go to the next slide, we should be able to see this. Oh, by the way, that building that, that I just showed you, that slide, that building was there until 1954. And it wasn't used as a train station anymore, okay? It was just boarded up. And in 1954, it was torn down for them to build a bank there. It's a shame it wasn't saved. Okay, the next one, please. Now, this is the train. This is the, the Florida Southern coming down Main Street. What you're looking into the background is the courthouse. Unfortunately, another bad battle casualty of time. In the 1960s, they tore our beautiful courthouse down and they put that thing up. Okay, next one, please. All right, now there is the famous uh, uh, triangle that I was telling you about. That's where the uh, Florida Southern crossed the Florida Central and Peninsula down there on Depot Avenue. And um, this is the interlocking and the device, the diamond to put this in uh, was delayed for seven weeks. So what happened was they couldn't interchange any traffic at all, the Florida Southern and the Savannah, Florida Western or the seaboard. None of them could interchange for seven weeks because somehow the thing was coming from Boston and they put it on the wrong ship and they ended up sending it, you know, to Germany or something instead of America. But they finally got it straightened out after seven weeks. And when I was a student here in the 70s, that link, that, that inter interlock was still there. It, the, the diamond was still there. You see a Gainesville uh, uh, fire, uh, fire department car. Uh, we're guessed that this picture's from about 1910. Next, please. Next, please. Okay, this is uh, an Atlantic coastline steam engine that, that used that route. Remember the Florida Southern became the plant system, which became the Atlantic coastline. And this, this is a good, it's, it's, this is a socially accurate uh, picture. Why do I say that? The man on the left with the oil can uh, is the engineer. And he's always gonna be Caucasian in the South. The man on the right, the African-American is the uh, fireman. The fireman who actually had more responsibilities than, the, than the, the engineer, he's on the right. And so all firemen on Southern railroads, without exception that I know of, were black. It wasn't a law, it was a custom. All, uh, at that time, at that time, and all engineers were white. Now the fireman was responsible for keeping the fire going, keeping the, the coal in there, the, the wood, to heat the water and to make the steam. And he was also in, in charge of regulating the steam so that they didn't have the boiler blow up or something like that. All the engineer did is apply the throttle and the brake. That was his job. And so the fireman uh, usually had to be learned. He had to be able to read and write. He had to be fairly good in math and be able to think on his feet. So it, it was not a, 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 a unimportant job. It was a necessary job. The train could not run without the fireman. They might be able to probably, he could also run the train if he had to in an emergency. Okay. Um, can we go to the next slide? Hi. How are you doing? Okay, I, I mentioned the shops. These are the shops. These are behind Main Street. This would be uh, west of Main Street uh, where the yards were in the shops for the Atlantic coastline, which previously was the Florida Southern and the plant system. Go ahead to the next one. These are the shops. Now you see the little Florida Southern steam engine. They were small, okay? Remember it's three foot gauge. So you have a small steam engine working a three foot gauge track. And when the plant system came in, the first thing they did is pull up all the Florida Southern's little three foot gauge and they put down standard gauge, four feet, eight and a half, Roman chariots. Next, please. Ah, you know this as a Santa Fe College building, an addendum to the Santa Fe College. This was the Gainesville Passenger Depot built by the Atlantic Coastline during 1947. They took their trains off of Main Street in 47. They put them on the T&J tracks. The T&J was no longer operating. They bought the T&J right away through Gainesville. It flanked the Northwest 6th, somewhere around Northwest 16th Avenue. Um, it crossed and it connected into the old ACL Main Line, which went down Main Street and then it went on to Hague. So this building is still there. It doesn't look like this. I took this picture many years ago, but uh, this, this was the, if you wanted to take a training yeah, out of Gainesville during the 19, uh, uh, late 40s, 50s and 60s and early 70s, and you wanted to leave Gainesville, this is the only station you could go to. Next, please. 
All right, here we have uh, a, a, a heavyweight pasture train with a diesel. Uh, it's probably circa 19, I'm thinking by the type of the diesel, probably circa 19, oh, 46, 47. Uh, they were still on Main Street. They were still now. He had to go four miles an hour. My father remembered hearing them because he was at the University of Florida. They had no AC. The windows were open and there weren't any large buildings. I'm talking about pre-Siegel buildings. So there was nothing to block the sound. He says when they came in in the morning, he says at every single crossing, they had to go two longs, a short and a long two. Well, he says the college stopped. He says, because the professor couldn't be heard over the coastline steam engines, which were really loud, and then the diesels. And until they got off of Main Street and they went on to 6th Street, this went on. At four miles an hour, every crossing, four hoots, the poor professors, I think they probably, some of them transferred to universities. Wanted. But I, of course, I would have loved it. Go on to the next one, please. All right, coming down Main Street, an earlier picture from the 30s. This is the Atlantic coastline coming down the middle of Maine. And you can see Maine wasn't so wide back then. And he's going four miles an hour. So if you want to cross town and you want to go east to west, you got a problem. Either you can, out, you can outrace the train maybe, or you're going to sit there for 15 minutes. Oh, what glory. Next one, please. Okay, I mentioned Rochelle, the junction of the Florida Southern and later the junction of the Atlantic coastline. And this is train is coming from McIntosh. He's coming from Tampa. And he's on his way to Gainesville. He's going to go on to the old Florida Southern Main Line, which is now the Atlantic Coastline. And his next stop from here, from Rochelle, is going to be Gainesville. I have walked this right away. Of course, the tracks are gone. The last time I saw a train here, they turned with the Y. They turned the Freedom Train here in 1976 with those huge Southern Pacific steam engines. I was there. I photographed it. I saw the Gandhi dancers realign the track with the cadence and the music. It was one of the most pastoral, beautiful American historical railroad scenes I think I ever saw in my life. I'll never forget it. Next, please. Okay, the Florida Southern had a branch line and that branch line went to Micanopy. And where did he go from? Micanopy Junction. Well, this is the station at Micanopy for the Atlantic coastline. It was their branch station. Uh, I have walked years ago the line between Micanopy and Micanopy Junction. It's gone now. Um, and uh, this was an interesting thing. You could actually take the train from Micanopy, in this case, go to Micanopy Junction, get on a passenger train, and go to e either New York or to Tampa. Now, you couldn't do that forever because this station, we think, was torn down in 1941. So the coastline pulled out of Micanopy early, but they, they, they kept the track to service the Franklin Crate Company. So some of you remember the tracks crossing, crossing 441 twice, going into Franklin Crate Company. If, if they'd gone on one more mile, they would have gone to this station, which was torn down in 1941. Next, please. All right, so I, it's partially blocked, but I believe that this is the station, the Atlantic Coastline Station, which was there uh, until 1976 or 1977 at Archer. Uh, and this was originally a, a, from the Jacksonville and Southwestern, go ahead. Ah, I mentioned the Savannah, Florida, and uh, the Savannah and Western, uh, Savannah, Western, and Florida. I, I should have, this, this is out of order. This is the railroad that was trying to beat the Florida Southern into Gainesville. They had the money, the plant system. They had the four, the standard gauge tracks. The little Florida Southern had the narrow gauge three feet tracks, and they met. They met at Seaboard Junction at that diamond that it took seven weeks to come in, but this was one of their timetables. They eventually became part of the plant system and, of course, then merged with Florida Southern and all the others and became the Atlantic Coastline. Next, please. Uh, this is a plant system timetable, and for a, a short period of time, these consolidated Florida railroads, these consolidated Florida railroads, uh, went under the name the plant system. Uh, after plant passed away, the, the, heirs, uh, the heirs of the estate sold the railroad to the Atlantic coastline and it became the Atlantic coastline. So the Florida Southern and the South Florida and the Jacksonville, Tampa, Key West, and all those lines that, that were under plant system were bought out and became the Atlantic coastline. Next one. 
Okay, there we have a plant system pocket map. Next one, please. Plant system timetable. I don't know who the guy is on the bottom. Some looks like he's from Mad Magazine, but no, that would be like 120 years later, so it can't be him. Maybe Mad Magazine got him for, you know, who knows. Uh, go to the next one, please. Ah, Micanopy Junction. Only picture we know. I think I got that from Caitlin. Only picture we know. Oh, no, I got it from the Micanopy Historical Society. There is a nice group of, of, of nice, fine-looking people from Micanopy Junction. And they are boarding the train, and they're getting, they either got off the train or they're getting on the train to go to Gainesville. So, you know, Micanopy Junction was a busy little place in its day. It handled eight passenger trains a day, but, but that was the, that was the station. It was just a shed with a roof. Okay. Um, and so I've been to Micanopy Junction only a couple months ago. We hiked through the, the wire grass and the tall grass and boy, I got stings to show you. But anyway, uh, we, we it's a, the, it's, there's a clearing out in the middle of the woods and there's the right away of the railroads. You know, there's the grades, you can see the grades. It's a tree line now, and that's all there's left to make an Opie Junction. At the one time there was shops, a yard, all of that. This is, uh, go to the next one, please. So these railroads uh, are successful in bringing goods and people into and out of here, uh, but they weren't always successful with everybody. For, for instance, there was a town called Noonansville, which was the Alachua County seat, and Noonansville was bypassed by the Savannah, Florida and Western uh, coming towards Gainesville. And they bypassed it by about two miles. Well, they put a station up, which they called West Noonansville, and that became today's Alachua. But within a very short order, uh, the town of Noonansville was no longer the county seat. They changed it to Gainesville. And the town of Noonansville went out of business today. There's a massive cemetery there. That's all there's left of Noonansville. Uh, but it was the county seat. And it, it couldn't compete with Gainesville. And the reason it couldn't compete was because of, well, the university eventually, but before the university, it, it, it could not compete with, the, uh, with, with uh, the, the railroad. It didn't have a railroad. And, and so you had to have a railroad to be successful back then. The railroad was the lifeblood of the town. It brought people, it brought mail, it had a telegraph, it brought express, it shipped your freight and your produce. I mean, this, this, this one entity, this railroad did all of that. There had never been anything like that before. The closest thing I can think to was the invention of the computer, uh, the, the, the home computer that can do almost just about everything and, or the, or the, or the, the cell phone. And this, this was an incredible thing. You're looking at a Gainesville and Gulf combo combination car. It's, uh, I believe it's sitting at Kirkwood and you're seeing its employees the conductor, the engineer, and the, the porter, the baggage man, the T and J known as the tug and jerk or the Tampa in Jacksonville, uh, uh, it, it was operated from Micanopy down to Amathla, from Micanopy back north to Samson City and had a station in Gainesville. Uh, it, it became established during the early 1890s. The depot in Gainesville was where there is a furniture store today at Northwest 6th and University Avenue. That furniture store used to be a Trailways bus station. And way back, we believe there was a wooden depot there for the TNJ, which is gone. The, is the TNJ's depot is still in Micanopy. You can see it recently. It got a new roof. It got a, uh, it got a metal roof. And the TNJ depot is still in Kirkwood. So at least we have two depots. It was known as the Fruit and Vegetable Route of Florida. Go on to the next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, there is one of its steam engines, okay. Uh, again, it was, it was, you know, colloquial known as the tug and jerk. Before that, the grits and gravy, grains on the Gulf. Next slide, please. Uh, here is the train pausing at Kirkwood. The man waving is Ike Eads. He was an old friend of mine. Next one, please. Uh, this is the TNJ depot I mentioned in Micanopy, although today it looks a lot better than this because this is 1960. The railroad had abandoned, the railroad went out of business in 1944. So here it had already been sitting for 16 years. Uh, but uh, it was a, a, a grand little railroad. Go on to the next, and that's still there. You can see it, and as I say, it's in better shape now. Go on to the next one, please. This is the Catherine. This is a good little story. The Catherine was the TNJ's rail motor car. It didn't need a steam engine to pull it. It was self-propelled. It went between Gainesville and Samson City every day, which was their northern terminus. The TNJ was 51 miles, and they, 
at, at something at, at, at uh, Santa Fe, at uh, this place where it went, it was called Grand Crossing. All these railroads met at Samson City. So you had the T and J, and you uh, you had the Seaboard, and you had the the Atlantic, uh, uh, the Atlantic and, and and Swanee River and Gulf. You had all these railroads, Georgia Southern and Florida, at Grand Crossing in Samson City. That's all. Today there's a church there. But this Catherine made that trip every day. When the Catherine went out of the passenger business in 1928, and they, the T and J still operated, but they weren't running passenger trains to, to Samson City anymore. Uh, this got purchased by somebody. It, it, it was over there in uh, off of Sixth Street, a little bit uh, east of Sixth Street, and it was being used as like a trailer home. And it was there until the early 70s. And I think then they just fell it apart. The city came and took it away. But it was a homemade uh, self-propelled car. And homemade ones were very rare. The TJ operated this for, for, for 30 years. Next, next one, please. This is some TNJ memorabilia. The rate book on the right uh, will tell you how, how much it cost from McKinnell to Gainesville. If you want, you must know it was 20 cents. And uh, the uh, Gainesville and Gulf TNJ same railroad pass on the left. The, the one on the bottom left is very interesting. It's a wood ticket. Now the TNJ was a wood burner. They never converted the coal. And so uh, what you would do is you would leave a pile of cut wood, it had to be certain specifications, a pile of cut, cut, cut pine on the side of the track. The train would come along and the fireman's responsibility is to get out with a big shovel and fill some bag that hung on the side of the train, filled it with the wood, and then stuck the wood up uh, in, in the tender. And of course the wood was used for fuel to boil the water to make the steam. Well, the wood ticket was something that was issued uh, you would, if you were a, if you had a pine or you had uh, woods that the track went through, you would get the wood ticket. You would put on the wood ticket how many pounds, how much this, how much that, and you know, and then you would fill the wood ticket out, hopefully responsibly and, and accurately, and you would leave it somehow in an envelope attached to the wood. And then once a month, you'd get a check from the T&J Railroad for the wood you supplied because, you know, they were going through, pe the people own these woods. They couldn't just cut the trees down. So this way, the farmer or whoever it was, they never had, they never ran out of supplies. They never ran out. Of, it was easy money. You leave some wood that you don't want on the side of the track. But that was a rare thing because by this time, already by, by the 30s, not that many railroads were still using wood. The T&J, well, they were taking advantage of all the woods on their line. They were still using wood. Next, please. Uh, this is one of their timetables, their employee timetables. They did change their name in their last uh, last 15 years to the Jacksonville, Gainesville and Gulf. They were purchased by the Seaboard. Seaboard changed their name. Next, please. This is a, uh, a piece of stationery this, uh, that's titled Jacksonville, Gainesville and Gulf. Ike Eads, who was a friend of mine, uh, he was a engineer on the railroad. And uh, this was the piece of paper they gave him when they terminated his services because they were terminating services, as you can see in 1944 on June 10th. And they were saying, Mr. Reeds, uh, basically uh, that uh, we are terminating and therefore you're termi you are terminating your employment on the same day we are. Thank you for your services. Goodbye, good luck. No pension, none of that. It was just, <clears throat> they were out of business. And uh, it was profitable for them at that point to pull up all their track, sell it to the War Department, melt it down. You have World War II is still going on in June of 44, D-Day, and use that for, for munitions. So more profitable for them to do that. Wood, uh, fruits and vegetables, which was their motto, weren't exactly profitable. Uh, perish, perish rate was high, a lot of perishables. So um, t and is out of business and everybody loved the T&J. People that lived there, really old people or the people that had parents still remember it. And I've investigated through the, through the years, these wonderful stories about the TNJ. Next one, please. <coughs> this is Newberry, Jacksonville and Southwestern. We'll have to cover that another time because we just ran out of time, but they used to run all the way from <clears throat> Live Oak to Newberry. Next one, please. This is one that ran here a few years ago, the Florida West Coast. They used the tracks of the Jacksonville Southwestern and they went bankrupt, they're gone. Next. This is a tram that ran between Gainesville and uh, Green Coast, uh, not Green Coast Springs, Gainesville and Melrose pulled by mules. So you had daily tram service to Melrose pulled by mules. Go ahead, next. 
passes. Again, this is where we started. Uh, some of the railroads that ran through Gainesville. Next one, please. Uh, next one, please. And this Western Railroad of Florida, which is three down on the left, that used to go between uh, Melrose, the, the Alachua County side, and uh, all the way to Green Cove Springs. Uh, there's a South Florida one on the bottom. That's the one that came through Gainesville. It went over to Palatka. Next one, please. That's it. Okay, so now, I'm sorry I had to rush through the end like that, but I get a little carried away. And there were some great stories I didn't tell you, but maybe I'll get them in. Uh, I'll entertain any questions. If anybody has any questions, I'll do my best. And I'll, I'll be honest, if I can't answer it, I'll tell you. So go ahead and, and uh, give me your questions. I'm happy to, if there's any. All right, so we already have um, several questions in the chat. Um, so the first one, let me go ahead and scoot back in the presentation is a question about the photograph of the Archer Depot. Okay. When was this picture taken? I took that picture in March of 1974 and the tracks were still there. Uh, partial, partial, part of the tracks were there that went to Gainesville for about five miles. They were no longer using the tracks uh, except to store freight cars and um, there was no longer a full-time agent at the, at the station. The station at this time was operated by the Seaboard Coastline Railroad. Now the depot is from 1911 and um, it was not the original depot, the original, there was a Union Station in Archer, there was another station before this, but this was the, the last Seaboard Depot, 1911 in Archer. And it's still there now, it's, it's operated by the Archer Historical Society and they just put a new roof on it, new floors, and they're, they're doing their best to save the building. Great. Um, so Bonnie would like to know. Oh yeah, just one more thing. It'll open in September sure. to the public. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the Cedar Key Museum has a great display of both the pencil and palmetto broom industry. The museum has a display case with brooms showcased from the 1939 New York World's Fair. Which railway transported these goods to the north? Okay, uh, Cedar Key got its name, of course, for the cedars that they used to make pencils. Um, there was <clears throat> rail service there until late 1932. Uh, there was also shipping there uh, during the 1930s. Uh, but after 1932, the, the volume of the rail business went down so much, Seaboard said they just couldn't afford to operate it anymore. Uh, they were running like a freight train every three days, like Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday or something. And so uh, in, in, in the midst of the National Depression, they, they couldn't keep it going. Now, as far as the, I can't answer about the 1939 World's Fair, uh, was there still uh, commercial ships out of Cedar Key at that time? There might have been, but I don't, I don't know of them. I know that there was no rail service at that time. Okay. Um, so here we have another question. How did they interchange cars with Florida Southern narrow gauge and the FCNP five foot gauge? Oh, I knew somebody was going to ask me that one. <laughs> um, there, it's interesting. They the they interchanged cars by they had a device that could pick the one car up and put it down onto the other one's tracks. In that area where they it, where they interchanged where they came together, there was like a third rail, a third rail so that the, the three foot gauge and the five foot gauge, they could both run, run on the same track. And they would pull the trains up next to each other and literally unload from one car to the other. Uh, but I know that the area around the diamond, there were, there were I'm not sure, exactly sure how it worked, but I know that it was a three rail situation and, and they made it work, but it, it took time. It took time to transfer the loads. And so eventually, you know, there was this kind of American, the American Association of Railroads decided we have to have a standard gauge. We had, this has to stop. Uh, mountain railroads or, or around Maine and Colorado, that's different. You can only go around the mountain if you only have three feet. There was even two foot gauge in Maine around the mountains. But in, in, in areas, other areas, they decided we have to go with standard gauge. Um, but there were devices to shift the cars from one line to the other and to load from one to the other. I just don't know what the mechanical, they did have names and I, I need to look that up and know what those devices were called. They could do it. It was costly and it was time, most, mostly time consuming. 
They did interchange traffic. They did interchange mm -hmm. traffic. Is there any other questions? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, so this is kind of on the same subject and you may have addressed it a little bit um, in the last question, but somebody has said, I read somewhere that the trucks of rail cars were switched out to fit the different gauges somewhere in Gainesville. Yes, I, I read that too. And that was in the area of the shops. Uh, that, that, that is correct. That is absolutely correct. I can't tell you exactly where, but it was done. Okay. Um, when did the T and J build into Gainesville? They came into Gainesville. They were, they were originally known as the Gainesville Rocky Point and Micanopy. And they chartered this line, um, but they never built it. And they used the same, similar charter. And in 1892, they come into Gainesville. And then they go south to Micanopy, and then they go all the way eventually to a little town called Imathla. So they're up and running in the 1890s as the Gainesville and Gulf Railway. Uh, about 1907 or 08, they become the, the camp in Jacksonville. And in 1933, they became the Jacksonville, Gainesville and Gulf. All right. Um, which was the line that made a beeline from North Main Street through Graham? Part of it ran through where the Murphy Well Field is now. Yeah, Graham was a stop on the T and J on the Tampa and Jacksonville. My wife and I were in Graham recently. The, the, the Graham has a post office, and for the life of me, with a couple of my rail buddies, I have Kevin and I have Frank, and I get these buddies. We go railroading in the woods. We can't find where the T and J went. We know it went through Graham. It had a stop there. It's in the timetable, <coughs> but we don't know where exactly it went through in Graham. Now, what was the question about Graham? Um, what was the line that made a beeline from North Main Street through Graham? Camp, Camp in Jacksonville Railroad, previously Gainesville and the Gulf, later Jacksonville, Gainesville and the Gulf. That's the name of that line. Okay. okay. And when did the mule tram to Melrose operate? The mule, as far as I know, as far as I know, it was around 1910 to 1915. It only lasted a few years. It had a name, FFNL. If anybody can figure out what the FFNL stands for, that's what, it, I, I don't know, but that's, but that's what the, it stood for, FFNL. <coughs> Lord knows what that stood for. Now in Melrose, besides that, they had the Western Railway of Florida, which went to Green Cove Springs. They had another railroad called the Melrose Railroad. It went 10 miles towards Gainesville to a mine or something. They had a depot in Melrose, a little depot. It's still there. It's a house. And if you go to the library and you say, where's the old Melrose Depot from the Melrose Railroad, which went 10 miles, they'll send you down the street, green and plank of that house. So <clears throat> one contraption or another, Melrose has Melrose had three different railroads. Now it has none. Hmm. Um, the railroad from Gainesville to Sampson City. Do you know of any stations along the way and was one of them Bellamy Station? Bellamy Station, Graham, now, Monte Oka, I believe in Bellamy were the same. I believe they were the same. Graham, Lori or Laurel, and Samson City. Uh, the only one with any significant population is Graham. Uh, Samson City, there's nothing there but the but tracks of the, uh, the CSX. And uh, that's the only, I couldn't find much at, at, at any of the other stops. A Cyril, Cyril, C-Y-R-I-L, Cyril was another one of the stops. Uh, a lot of these were wood stops. They would stop there to pick up their wood. And like I said, and they'd pile the wood and they'd give it a name. Um, uh, the T&J was famous on that route to Samson City for stopping their trains for people that wanted to go blackberry picking and blueberry picking. Stop the trains to do that. Uh, they weren't on a tight schedule. When I was a student at the University of Florida in 1974, I would, uh, my professor, Dr. Jack Doherty, the late Dr. Doherty says, let's go blackberry picking. He was a rail fan. So we'd go, he, he knew where the right of way was uh, north of 39th street. And we'd get on the right of way and you could, you could still walk it. And uh, we picked buckets and buckets of blackberries. And uh, I don't know whether those were wild or left over from the time people were growing them with blueberries professionally but we always loaded up our buckets and I've, I've looked to try to find where that was. That was 1973, 74. I can't find the right of way uh, uh, north of 39th Avenue, but if I could, I know I could fill up my buckets again with blackberries. Next, please. 
Uh, let's see. The freight railroad running through Green Gainesville. Yes. Uh, who operates it and what areas does it connect? We're talking about today? I believe so. Okay. The only railroad that goes into North Gainesville, of course, is CSX. Now, CSX used to be Seaboard Coastline. And before that, that railroad was the, was the uh, Atlanta Coastline. And before that, it was the Savannah, Florida, and Western plant system. So I gave you its chronology, its, its, its bi uh, biography. <clears throat> and the, what it does now is it feeds a GRU plant with coal cars. Once a month, there's a coal train. And GRU operates a plant there. I don't know whether they use the coal full time or as a backup, but they still bring coal into there. It's the only reason there's a track into North Gainesville. Okay. It, and it continues to go north. And uh, it, it, Burnett's Lake is a junction. And from Burnett's Lake, it goes northeast to Jacksonville. Now, that was the original route of the Jacksonville and Southwestern Railroad which was very profitable and plant bought within five years. Within, by 1902, he bought, he bought it right away. It only lasted from 97 to, nine, to, uh, to uh, 1902 independently because it made so much money. But that is what comes into North Gainesville. It's the, it's the old Savannah, Florida Western, uh, which connected with the, with the uh, plant system. Okay. Um, so we have another question about the engine going down Main Street. Yes. Uh, wondering about the actual picture itself. So let me go ahead and pull that back up. Uh, in, one, in one shot, it shows the courthouse across the street. I had one of them, um, which so of the, course the courthouse is gone, the old courthouse. The question is that they can't actually see the rails in the picture. And they're just wondering if that is because of the low quality of the image itself. It's probably that, and let's see, is that the one there? We've got this one, and we had a couple of the Main Street images. Okay, there's, there's one right there. Okay, the rails were there, but they were kind of embedded in the asphalt. And um, <clears throat> because remember, cars were going over them. And they were, and so they were embedded in the asphalt. One of the reasons that the main reason the train was going four miles an hour is not because it was going to avoid hitting traffic. It was because any far faster than that, it might have come off the rails. They, they, those were, those were, they were using sixty pound rail, but it was embedded into the asphalt, and so the train had to go very slow not to derail, uh, very, very slowly, and um, that's what it did. And it's, I don't, you know, it, maybe it derailed once in a while, but most of the time it wouldn't if it kept at four miles an hour. You can run any train at four miles an hour, and it'll, it'll run on asphalt if you have to. But no, it did run on tracks. Okay. Um, Martha would like to know a little bit more about the role of the railroad during the Civil War. Um, she understands that it ran arms and food from Cuba to Jacksonville to be embarked for Confederate troops. That's correct. And the, at, uh, while it was running, while it was operating, it was very, very important for the Confederacy because they could receive ships from Cuba and other places at Cedar Key, and they could receive ships at Fernandina, especially ships at Cedar Key, because then you could take your, your, your goods and, your, and your, your war materials, you could take them uh, Northeast. So it, it did play a prominent role. And as I, I stated before, the Florida Railroad made a lot of money transporting Confederate supplies and Confederate troops during the Civil War, a tremendous amount. And a lot came from Cuba. And when the combined uh, forces of the federal forces, gunboats coming in and blowing up Cedar Key and Fernandina, and then the Confederate troops raiding 20 to 30 miles of track so they could have the railroad somewhere else, uh, it put an end to the Florida Railroad. And that actually hurt the Confederacy but it was very profitable for 17 months uh, bef before those gunboats ruined Fernandina and Cedar Key. And they did accept supplies from ships. <clears throat> All right, um, so this one is not a question, it is a comment. Um, somebody has said that coal is no longer brought into GRU. It is lime for exhaust scrubbers, brick at hardwood brick and lumber at 84 lumber. Okay, so they're saying that there's nothing brought into GRU on that line? Is that what they're saying? Um, they're saying at least that uh, it's not coal. Okay, they're, but they're mentioning something else that's brought in. Um, yeah, so they said lime for exhaust scrubbers. Okay. 
at Harwood Brick and Lumber at 84 Lumber. Okay, maybe it's possibly somebody from GRU, I don't know. But I know that I have seen myself uh, uh, coal trains come in and park there. And then, and then I've seen the engines come in and bring out the empty cars. So it's possibly they don't do it anymore, but in the not so recent past, I have seen them bring coal in there. All right, so we're going to take, I think, just two more of these questions that we have uh, coming up. Um, so this one is, what are the best resources for railroad research? I have seen Sanborn maps and historic aerials at the UF collections, but I'm curious if there are other resources out there. There's Traveler's Official Railroad Guides, which gives schedules and maps uh, starting in the 1850s. And they issued one every month. And so the biggest fat ones are the 1920s because that was the most railroads. Uh, I don't, I, I, they may all, they may all of it be, be online, available online because to get the original guides, they're expensive and they're difficult to find. But they, they are just a wealth of information, uh, you know, about these railroads. Um, uh, there's also archives at Micanopy for, for local archives. Uh, there's your own museum, the Matheson. Um, the uh, University of Florida has the, the famous Florida collection. Uh, Sandmore, Ban Sanborn maps are good. Um, the other thing that's available is you can get a hold of some old railroad timetables. Most of them have very good maps. I, I would say that it's just a huge variety of, 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 of you know, what's available. And because of computers now, uh, there's a lot more available that's at your touch that when I was doing research for railroads back in the early 70s, you know, we had to do interlibrary loan and all that just to find things. Now you can bring it up on the computer. The state of Florida has a terrific archives for both information and for photography. And they have a railroad uh, photograph thing that's available. And you can get pictures of any depots that they have uh, reasonably. Uh, and I, I, would, I would start there with the universe, with uh, the state of Florida uh, historical archives and photo photographic archives. They have tremendous stuff. Uh, and you can try the traveler's official guide, try to go online and see what years are available. And in the back of them, they list alphabetical, all the depots and all the railroads they ran. And where did I come up with this crazy statistic about the stations being 75 yards apart at Depot Avenue? Very simple from the back of a, 1883 official guide and it says you know the names of the depots savannah florida western florida southern and then florida central peninsula and it says the first two are adjacent and the other one is 75 yards away so that's where i got that information great um so we have a follow-up from the gru uh oh, no. Uh, well, I opened up a can of worms with that. I'm sorry. <laughs> said that once the plant was converted to natural gas, the coal was stopped. The plant by CX, CSX and the coal cars are stored up at the plant currently. Covered hoppers are still received at GRU filled with lime. Okay, well, that's good. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to guess that the lime comes from Florida uh, because lime is still a big, big uh, production, especially in South Florida and Miami. Uh, and so I'm just guessing that it comes from there. I'm glad that they kept the plant open. I'm glad that they received goods there because otherwise we wouldn't have a railroad. And I, I only wish that, you know, they had never cut the line to the airport, but they turned that into a rail to trail, which is fine. And rail to trails are great, but it would be nice to still have the trains going through Gainesville and going out to the airport and, you know, they're not, and going to Archer and all these other places, but they're not anymore. And I, I hope that uh, whatever GRU is shipping into and out of uh, this uh, plant, that they keep it going as long as possible and not give CSX an excuse to take up the tracks because they will. And so I'm a big supporter of whatever's coming into that plant. Not here, it's not here. Is going to be the last question. Um, this is one that a couple of people have asked. Uh, they would just like to hear a little bit more about the railroad in High Springs. Yeah, that was one of the things that I didn't get to talk about. I'm sorry, I ran out of time. High Springs was a major rail center. It was, for the Atlantic Coastline Railroad, it was a division point. They had shops there. They could do major repairs there. They had section gangs housed there to fix tracks. 
So High Springs was a, a major rail center. They had a yard there. And um, all of this was changed. All of this, this before World War II, High Springs was, was de-emphasized. And they didn't need as, remember when they converted to diesel engines, they didn't need the amount of, of, of shops available for fixing things. And they could, put a, they could put a steam engine together at High Springs. They could build it from scratch. Once they started converting to diesel, and that was as early as 1939, uh, they didn't need those kind of facilities anymore. They didn't have the volume. They didn't have the amount of trains they were running. And uh, the big thing is, is they had converted to diesel. High Springs had major steam shops. Uh, and of course, uh, what's sad in that today is that the, the depot was saved. It was moved a block off the right of way. They do have a High Springs Railroad Museum but uh, the lines that went that interchanged there uh, they aren't there anymore. And um, there was three different Atlantic Coast line, lines that went into High Springs, one from Alachua, and none of them are functional anymore. They're all gone, the tracks are gone. Uh, very sad about High Springs because it really was a major, if you, if you were a steam enthusiast, you like steam engines, High Springs would have been your place to go to photograph steam engines because they, it was a major repair center and a division point. And it's, there's, there's places like that all over the place. Waldo used to have a big railroad yard. I was in the woods the other day in Waldo. Waldo had a turntable. Can you imagine that, a turntable in Waldo? It's still there in the woods. Uh, and that was a division point for the seaboard, like uh, High Springs was a division point for the Atlantic coastline. And unfortunately, that's, that's yesterday. They didn't keep one track in High Springs. High Springs was a real railroad town. The whole town revolved around the railroad. And now there's no railroad in High Springs. It's very sad, but I am glad that they saved their depot. They, the coastline, the seaboard coastline made them move the depot to save it. They moved it across the street, very expensive. And then a few months later, they abandoned the track. They could have left it and let it stay there in the original place. That's common with railroads. They do things like that. Okay. I enjoyed this very, very much. And thank you for having me. I probably did not answer all your questions to your to satisfactory level. I'll try to remember some of them and, and look some of the stuff up. Um, I'm very happy with GRU burning whatever they're burning in that plant because it keeps trains coming to North Gainesville. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, if people have more questions and they want to get in contact with you, what is a good way for them to do that? Uh, yeah, I'll give you my email. Um, I'm happy to entertain anything from an email. It's, it's old Florida, O-L-D-F-L-O-R-I-D-A, 5-3, that's the numbers 5-3, old Florida 5-3 at bellsouth.net. And although I may, may, might not be able to give you the answer that you want, I will try to answer every comment and question. And uh, my buddies and I, when it gets cool again, will continue to go out into the woods and find abandoned right-of-ways like Micanope Junction and places like that. Uh, and I'll, I'll keep you abreast of, of my adventures. Well, great. Thank you so much. And thank you to everybody who joined us this afternoon. Um, I hope that you enjoyed this. And please do uh, answer the survey that will be coming out tomorrow through your email to let us know what you thought of this program and what you would like to see from us in the future.